We are live. So welcome if you are tuning in to um, Boston by Map, April 21st edition, um, MBTA uh, history, um, Green Line History Day. Um, welcome if you are tuning in later after the fact. We're just going to start in a minute, um, but we're going to we're looking at this really beautiful um, animation of the Green Line or of the whole MBTA uh, map history that Dennis just pulled up. So, oh wow. I have never seen this before. So, <laughs> I really like this. Yeah, this is a great thing. You said you think it's from 2012? It's from 2012, yes. Uh, it's been um, actually, this is not the current version. The, the author tweaks it every now and then. And uh, the current version you get, if you just go directly to the website, uh, does not have everything that this page had. So if you scroll down on this page, you'll actually get access to the individual frames for the various years that are going by if you want to you know, look at one at length. That's really great. Okay, so I have one thing that I have to pull up and then we can get started. Oops. Do you want me to stop sharing while you? No, you're all good. Okay. Um, so welcome everybody. If you've been to one of these before, this one will be slightly different um, just because we have um, slightly different materials um, in terms of our, what is this, Microsoft Edge. Um, in terms of our content, but the kind of basic format is the same. Um, so hopefully we can just follow along, do some historical geography research with Dennis, and then um, in the end we can answer any of your questions that you have about historical geography of Boston, um, et cetera. So um, without further ado, I just want to mention off the bat that we are presenting this from land that is occupied, um, that this land um, that we are talking about, Boston, uh, has been lived on for tens of thousands of years by Native peoples, and um, we are guests here uh, on this land. So that's kind of an abbreviated version of what I usually do, but I haven't pulled it up. So <laughs> um, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that um, we have a really good um, native land uh, digital, mm -hmm. um, digital mapping project, native-land.ca that we often refer people to. It's not our, uh, project, but it's a, a project that I highly recommend for looking at whose land you're on today, um, the treaties involved, and um, language groups um, spoken in places where you live. So, if you want to drop in the chat, if you're not um, if you're not from Boston, um, if you're not uh, on uh, the land that we're on, you might want to drop in in the chat whose land you're on. Um, but it's up to you. We do want to make this interactive. So dropping anything in the chat is great. We actually already have a comment um, saying that the animation missed the addition of assembly station on the orange line, which is an interesting. Uh, oh, this, uh, good catch. This was done in 2012 and apparently the author hasn't updated new developments since then. I'd have to get to the, watch all the way to the end of the animation to see. When did Assembly Square open? I don't know. No. <laughs> I've only lived here for four years. <laughs> or is that, I can't see, is that it right there? Or is that? There's to... Community College in Sullivan. Yeah, oh, it doesn't okay. have Assembly. All righty. Good catch, Ron. We will, uh, I'll put up in a moment the, uh, the uh, links to that site and it's also in the handout which uh, Rachel posted to which Rachel posted a link in the chat area yeah assembly opened in 2014 Ron says okay Mr. Van Schnuger again 
should update this. If maybe we'll send, we should send him a note. I posted in, um, like Dennis said, I posted in the chat the handout for today. So if anybody has, um, I mean, if anybody wants to follow along and have the links that we're referring to, um, they are right there at that bit.ly link. Cool. So do you want to start us off, Dennis? Okay. So uh, the agenda is the same as it is for all these talks. We'll do a little bit about boilerplate about history through maps, uh, then we'll go into our example, and then we'll, uh, after that, we'll uh, show you where to get more maps online. So uh, <clears throat> basically using maps to tell history uh, is a great way to add to your story. You can answer questions like, what used to be here? Or what, what is that on today's map? Or how did some part of Boston develop over time? Or in this case, how does, a feature of Boston, the transportation infrastructure uh, develop over time. Uh, we're gonna talk about the MBTA green line. Uh, there's, uh, so it's basically, I, I, first of all, in the sources here, this animated history of the MBTA, that's the link that's in the handout. I can take you to that. That's just a great fun thing. And the other, if you're interested in more detail, once we get out over this, there's two books. Uh, the Tremont Street Subway book was published by the Boston Street Railway Association in, in 1997 for the 100th anniversary of the Tremont Subway. And then there's a book that just came out called Boston in Transit. You, uh, those of you who uh, may, you might have, some of you might have joined uh, the Map Center online event. I guess mm -hmm. it was last month, Rachel, where Garrett uh, Nelson uh, interviewed the author of the book and showed off parts of it. Yeah, that was, yeah, a couple weeks ago now. Uh, that was fun. So and that video, that video is on our, on our website, on our YouTube, on our Facebook, if anybody wants to see it. And uh, in addition to the book, there's a companion website, which I believe is also bostonintransit.com, all mm -hmm. run together, which has lots and lots of images and maps that are in the book. So it's, it's great fun to look at. Uh, so the MBTA green line sort of, we're going to cover there's three phases of its history. There's a street railway phase, then there's a subway tunnel phase and its expansions. And then finally, we'll talk about the modern era in this part of the MBTA. Uh, the green line is, as you may know from direct experience, the green line is a bit different than the red, orange, and blue lines. Uh, it's different technology. And it, it's uh, unlike the other lines, it doesn't have like a birth date. You know, the, the orange line opened in 1901, the red line opened in 1912. Uh, there's no firm date at which the green line came into existence other than 1967 when the colored lines came in, were, uh, were, not, were created by the MBTA. So let's start at the beginning. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and look at this. So uh, the, the first street railway opened in 1856. It ran between Cambridge and Boston, uh, Central Square in Cambridge to Bowdoin Square in Boston. Uh, so it was pulled, as you can see in the picture here, it's pulled by horses. And it's, you know, what you can't see so well in the picture though, is that it runs along tracks that are laid flush in the street. So the top of the track is level with the, the street pavement. So that because it's sharing the road with, of course, other horse-drawn vehicles, carriages and wagons, as well as pedestrians. Uh, this was quickly followed by many other uh, horse-drawn streetcar lines. Uh, they were all in these at this time privately owned companies. So they did get a charter to allow them to operate on the streets. Uh, there's a famous book in Boston history called Streetcar Suburbs by Sam Bass Warner. And he points out that the, the big impact that, that uh, streetcars had was in expanding the residential area of the city. Uh, this, before, street, before these horse-drawn streetcars, working class people who wanted to commute to work in Boston could only live as far away as they could walk in say 45 minutes. The uh, advent of the streetcars expanded the commuting radius to four miles. Uh, and, and where the streetcar lines went, residential developments soon followed. They sort of went hand in hand with each other. 
Now, the many streetcar lines that proliferated starting in 1856, by the 1880s, it had con consolidated down into uh, just a few. And this is a map of, oop, this one's there. Yeah. This is a map of, uh, reconstructed map of the streetcar lines in Boston in 1886. The different colors are for the different companies. But the basic idea is you got all these streetcar lines that converge on, on the Shawmut Peninsula, part of central Boston, from the neighboring towns, from Charlestown, from Cambridge, from <coughs> Roxbury, and from South Boston and Dorchester below that. Now the... Uh, now each of these sort of had a geographical monopoly. Um, now the other thing to notice here is that in 1886, there is no predecessor of, let me zoom in, most of the green line today. There was a line, streetcar line going out Huntington Avenue, but there's no Beacon Street, no Commonwealth Avenue as yet. What happens is that uh, in 1887, a man named Henry Whitney organized, uh, saw this as an opportunity, and he organized two companies. Uh, one was the West End Land Company to do real estate development, and the other was the West End Street Railway. And he negotiated with uh, Brookline to extend Beacon Street through Brookline uh, as a boulevard with space reserved for streetcars so they wouldn't have to run down the middle of the street, which made, for, uh, made them more predictable in terms of uh, their speed and traffic. He did want to, you know, connect with the other existing streetcar lines, but the, those companies wanted nothing to do with the new competitor. So he uh, arranged a what we call later a hostile takeover, uh, and all of the ex all of the existing lines shown on this map came under the control of the West End Street Railway uh, in 1892 or 1887, excuse me. And this uh, so that basically here's the map in 1892 of what the the West End Street Railway looked like. Uh, it was, this was the first, was America was like the first city in the world to have, or excuse me, Boston was the first city in America to have a unified transit system. This is actually the largest transit system in the world. Uh, it owned over 8,000 horses to pull those uh, streetcars at the time. Now the next big development was replacing the horses with uh, electric motors. This is, picture is of the first uh, streetcar in the West End system to become electrified. As you can see on what, it's, what it says on the side, it's one, it ran on Beacon Street through Brookline. The uh, conversion to electric started in 1899, 1889, excuse me, and it was 90% complete by 1894. Uh, the last horse-drawn streetcar ran uh, as late as 1900 on Marlboro Street in the Back Bay. And all of those horses were replaced by these robots at this point. The electric streetcars were faster than the horse-drawn streetcars, so this uh, expands the commuting radius out to six miles. So the tracks are extended, uh, more home homes are developed along the streetcar lines, and that meant more cars were coming into town. Uh, the problem was that many, you know, a large portion of the streetcar lines entering Boston were coming in to the city and converging on Tremont Street and Washington Street through downtown. Uh, this is a picture of looking down Tremont Street from Park Street and taken in 1895. And as you can see, this is the daily streetcar traffic jam. There are streetcars here and going back as far as the eye could see. So this is a big problem. Uh, and the, there were a number of solutions considered, and one of the, the one they, conver they converged on was to get the streetcars off the street and put them underground in a tunnel. So here's an 1895 plan for what the, uh, what, the, what the new tunnel would look like. So the tunnel, when complete, uh, <clears throat> ran from Boylston Street here and, and uh, Tremont Street, up Tremont Street, and then along Washington Street, past Haymarket Square and popped out the other end uh, near North Station, this is Causeway Street here. So it had a portal here between Haymarket and North Station, and it had two portals, two entrance ex ways to get in and out, one on Boylston Street right next to the Public Garden, and the other on Tremont Street down near Pleasant Street. 
Uh, the tunnel opened on September 1st, 1897. And here's a nice picture. Uh, this is the picture taken that day near the Boylston Street portal on uh, next to the public garden. And if you look really closely, you can see, you know, this one's going out to Reservoir. This one is going to Pearl Street in Cambridge and then on to Alston. Now, you often hear, hear it said that Boston had the first subway in America. It opened in 1897. Uh, in 1897, it, the, the tunnel was only complete uh, up to Park Street. It, was, it wasn't until 1898 that it was completed all the way to North Station. But you know, you heard it said we had the first first subway in America. It opened in 1897, and, but and it included only the Park Street and Boylston Street stations. And I was very confused when I heard that because I thought that meant uh, it meant you mean there was a subway train that just ran back and forth between Park and Boylston and nowhere else. That that wouldn't be very useful. And I just sort of mis I was mis I misunderstood the statement. Um, the reality was that it was just a streetcar tunnel that the streetcars that went into the tunnel starting in 1897 ran the same route they had run before. It's just that the last section of it was uh, underground in the tunnel. For example, the first car to use the tunnel on that morning, the early morning that day started in Alston and made its way into that portal. Uh, it started on Cambridge Street near Wilton. So I put it on the map here. It took this strange route because uh, um, it went East on Cambridge Street, across the river, took a right on Putnam and Cambridge, took a left on Pearl Street, went up to Mass Ave, then went down Mass Ave, crossed the river, all the way to Boylston Street, turned left on Boylston Street, and ran whoop, along Boylston Street till here, where it got went down in the portal. So, 90, so basically, the only change from the day before to the day after uh, the tunnel opening was that the, the streetcars would do the last 10% or so of their run in a tunnel rather than above ground. Everything else was just the same. So I found it misleading to, re, to talk, call that a subway. Yeah, I um, was always confused by that too. Thank you for clearing that yeah, up. And it, yeah, because and, you know, I mean, there is a difference. Uh, so there's uh, subway is an ambiguous term. So the difference is streetcars and rapid transit lines. Either one can be underground. But uh, if you want to see the difference, go to uh, North Station. Go, you know, go down. Stay after you go through the after you go through the turnstiles. Go down one level, and as you come down the escalator, the green line is cars are going to be to your right, and the left and the orange line cars are going to be for your left on your left. These are the inbound cars, and you can sort of see the difference if you walk if you walk over to either side and look for the where does the power come from on the green line side? It's a cable on the roof suspended from the roof. But on the orange line side is a third rail down by the rails that the, that, that the wheels run on. Uh, as the trains come into the station, you can see another difference. The orange line trains, the rapid transit trains move much faster than the green line trains. Also, green line cars come in in ones and twos. You know, a train is two and sometimes they're individuals. The orange line cars are six or eight. The orange line trains are six or eight cars. And then when the, the doors open, you can see yet another difference. Uh, on the orange line, you step, there's no, there's no step up or down. You just walk from the platform onto the train, the, the, the train floor level and the platform are at the same level. But when the green line doors open, you have to take one step up in the middle of the cars, but if you use the door at the end of the car, you go up three steps. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, the, uh, the West End Street Railway becomes, in 1897, also becomes part of the new Boston Elevated Railway Company, comes under that control of that, which built the Orange Line that opened in 1901. Now the, you know, this, so this, there's no exact date where you can say the streetcar line has become the green line, but we'll just think of it as the, the, proto, the proto green line at this point and talk about what <laughs> happened next. Uh, the first change happens in 1912 when the, so what we think of today, the Green Line got extended. It used to end at North Station. In 1912, it's extended all the way to Leachmere in Cambridge. It went from North Station to the river by uh, an elevated track, and which connected to this new Leachmere viaduct. So the, uh, the trains did not have to take the bridge. For, uh, they, can they could be separate from the traffic and not get involved with traffic jams. 
The next thing that happened was two years later in 1914, this is the, the tunnel that used to end here next to the public garden. It's extended out past the Boston Public Library, Copley Square, past Mass Avenue, past the uh, Charles Gate entrance in the fens here. And it, then, it, then it came above ground to Kenmore Station. So there was a portal right here and there was no underground station at this time. And so this means that uh, many of the trains that were going out Beacon Street or later Commonwealth Avenue no longer were running along Boylston Street. But the portal back here did remain open because some of the trains coming out here would take a left onto Hun and this diagonal uh, onto Huntington Avenue, which used to run all the way through Copley Square. Mm. Now the uh, next thing that happened was in 1932, the Kenmore end of the line gets moved in below ground into an underground station. And at that time they built portals west of that for Beacon Street and Commonwealth Avenue. This is the old portal coming out from the underground leading into Kenmore Station. That we get, uh, you know, but there are remains of it, I believe, that can still be seen. Now, the um, next thing that happened was a, uh, a similar extension of tunnels, only this time for Huntington Avenue. So as I was saying, the, uh, the Huntington Avenue cars came out at uh, still at the Public Garden, went along down Boylston Street and then angled off Huntington Avenue. Uh, in the, uh, in, starting in 1937, a tunnel was created, all the way to connecting to the Boylston Tunnel on the east end and uh, going west past Symphony Hall. It was a WPA project that uh, was completed in 1941. And after that, they could close off and remove the Boylston Street portal next to the, the garden. The last big extension of the, of the uh, what would later be called the Green Line happened in uh, 1959. Let me go back to this old map. Oh, this one here, I guess, is what I want. Uh, and zoom in on, if you look on this map, you can see that this is the, this purple line here is the Boston and Worcester, later Boston and Albany Railroad. It had a branch line that headed down past Longwood and out to Newton here. Uh, that was no longer, and then reconnected with the main line west of Riverside. That was no longer being used by the Boston and Albany. So it was a, uh, turned over to the MTA as, as it was called. Uh, as an aside, what ha uh, let me talk about that in a second. Converted into, uh, to, to use by the same equipment, same streetcars as the other Green Line branches were using. And at that time they also uh, replaced this merge with a new portal, the Fenway portal that led in to the uh, Kenmore station. And so here's a picture of one of the cars being used, whoops, at that time out at Riverside. Now, if you look at the car on the side, it says MTA. Uh, after World War II, uh, these, these uh, public transit lines were, were operating at a loss. Uh, so the company sold, so a public transportation authority was created, the MTA in 1947, which took over uh, the existing lines of the Boston Elevated Railway. Now, the Green Line became the Green Line officially in 1967 when the uh, the MBTA, which was formed in 1964, took over the MTA as well as commuter rail lines that, from railroads that were going out of business. The uh, the MBTA commissioned the Cambridge Seven, a design firm, mostly an architecture firm. They designed the, the old the first building of the aquarium there on, on the waterfront uh, to create what they, what they what was, ended up being called the spider map because it had eight legs. And the, this is, a, I could not find a clean image. This is an, uh, a photograph of one of the old maps, uh, you know, not in great shape because it's actually in a subway station, but you can see it has coming out of here, there's a Huntington Avenue line that leads down the Arbor Way. There's a Riverside line we just talked about, the Beacon Street line that goes to Cleveland Circle. Uh, two lines that go along Commonwealth Avenue, one that continues on Commonwealth 
out to Boston College. It's still there today. And one that ran along Commonwealth Avenue and did not, and at Packard's Corner, continued straight onto North Beacon Street and then Washington Street through Brighton and out to Watertown. The, that line was closed in 1969. Um, you don't see it here on this 1973. This is a much cleaner version of the spider map. But that A line out to Watertown is not there. Here's a picture of one of those uh, same kind of cars, the PCC cars, as they're called, as we saw on the Riverside. Uh, this is on Washington Street next to St. Elizabeth Hospital and, and near Brighton Center. Uh, but as you can see, this is, you can still see its streetcar origins. It's got the catenary line up above and the tracks run right down the middle of the street. Today, if you want to see track, uh, uh, a green line car running down the middle of the street, you'd have to go down to uh, go out Huntington Avenue past the Museum of Fine Arts. And for the rest of that run, it's, it goes down the middle of Huntington that, that, where it ends at Heath. The, uh, the last, the uh, other contraction that happened was the um, e branch was discontinued. The, the that e branch uh, was discontinued past Heath in 1985. Now there's one more change, of course, coming up soon to the green line. This is a, but this is the line today. So you can see there's no A line. There's a B, C, and D, and E. The E only goes as far as Heath. It doesn't go the Arbor Way. But what's coming up soon is the green line extension through Somerville and uh, Medford, which is, according to the MBTA, supposed to be completed in December of this year. So that's what I've got in terms of our example. So let's go back and just sort of go on. Uh, so the handout will have these links to all the images and maps I was showing you. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for uh, historic maps of Boston, uh, you know, the Leventhal Map Center has thousands and there's more besides that. So what I've got here that's also in the handout is sort of a, where do you get started with all these historic maps of Boston? And here's sort of a top 10 list put together based on input from Nancy Seasholes and Ron Grimm, the former curator at the Leventhal Map Center. And if you wanna find them online, uh, you know, there's a number of places you know, the first two places you should go are the, the two uh, destinations for the Leventhal Map Center, the uh, Atlas Scope and Digital Collection. I'm going to turn it over at this point to Rachel to show you those. Yeah. So let me add my window. Um, so Atlas Scope is a very cool tool that we've developed that um, you can use to explore kind of the um, the historic geography of Boston specifically and some of the inner suburbs as well. Um, you can either click find me over on the left, which is really useful if you're walking around, if you're on your phone and you want to, you're walking past a building and you say, I wonder what this building used to be. Um, you can click find me and let it um, track your GPS. Uh, you can search places or you can start at BPL um, at Copley. So that'll drop you down at the central library. You can see, you can actually see exactly what Dennis was just talking about or one of the, one of the many things we were just talking about that Huntington Ave used to come straight through Copley here um, in 1874 because it drops you in the oldest year um, by default. And then down here in the bottom right hand corner, there's a, a drop up list and you can select different um, different layers. Uh, so we have all of these different layers of urban atlases of Boston. Um, and you can really see the, the railroads, especially in the late 19th century maps, not so much in the early 20th century ones because they, you know, get whatever the word for culvert it is, but for trains, <laughs> you get pushed underground. Um, but yeah, these are really beautiful maps. The reason that we developed this tool is that our maps are, these maps are huge. So I actually have an example here that I can show you. Um, which is this giant plate 
atlas plate from uh, this actually, this 1938 atlas that I'm showing you right now um, over by Charles Gate. This is the exact, this is the plate that I was showing you. Um, and it's uh, much easier to use these atlases in this format than it is, as you can probably imagine, to use them in their, their large format original setting. If you are using the, the physical atlases, you have to um, have a lot of table space. You have um, the, the plates don't line up for every year. So let's say this area is, this area is plate 22 in the atlas that I'm talking about. But um, in a different year, it might be on a different page. And that is very, um, very inconsistent and very difficult to, to line up your work. So if you're trying to do historical geography, um, having these maps that are consistent across the years and geo-referenced to modern, uh, modern day maps is really useful. Could you slide that over to Copley Square? Yeah, for the 1938. Uh, oh, either one doesn't matter. I want. Yeah, I want to. Decide. This is this this one is good about having the uh, about showing the um, the streetcar tunnel. And if you take it back, yeah. So there's, and if you take it all the way back to the east to the public garden, does it show the portal still? Yeah, you can see the the portal on the public garden there. Right here where it says incline. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So we have these like very beautiful resources that are highly detailed. You can see like this one, all of them really. They're um you can see like the paper grain, you can see the pencil markings that people have made on these maps before. Um, like for some reason this the Thorndike building was crossed out sometimes since 1938. Um, it's not always clear why that happens, um, but sometimes it is. And the original purpose of these maps was as fire insurance and real estate atlases. So um, what they're focused on really is talking about property value for the most part, or um, kind of like danger uh, certain buildings are in, um, whether they're they're really expensive to insure because of um, boilers and few night watchmen or whatever. There's, um, I can't remember, I think it's the 1885. Yeah, this one is super detailed in terms of having um, like markings describing like the window situation. So like up here, these little um, like dot and dashes with slashes through them those have to do with how many windows there are and on what floor they are. So like whether you can escape easily in a fire. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of detail. I, I really love this one in particular. And the typography on this one is beautiful. And there's a lot of interesting stuff like this coffin factory here that is just downtown that I didn't know about before. Is it is this a sand a sandborn or yeah this is a sandborn. Why don't you click on about this map so that people can see where you... Yeah, oh good point. So down here in the bottom right hand corner, you can click about this map. It'll pop up um, some source information, including the title of oh, Zazu. Stop walking across my desk. <laughs> um, the insurance maps of Boston. Um, it tells you who the publisher is in the year. And then you can also click through um, any of these links, which is very helpful for learning more information about the plate itself or about um, being able to use it to in your own research. So like right down here, you can download the plate footprints, the GeoJSONs, um, which is very useful if you're trying to do your own um, mapping and you want to bring this in as a base map or something else of some sort of layer. Um, you can click find this plate in digital collections. Oh, that opens a new tab, um, which is not sharing, but it'll bring you to um, to a new page and you can kind of click on uh, view this plate in digital collections and it'll take you to 
a um, a picture of the plate that's just the the rectangle um, that I showed you this this real version of, and you'll be able to zoom in really high uh, resolution, and you can even download it um, and bring it into your own work. You can also, using Atlascope, compare different years. So you don't actually have to compare it always to the original base map, the like modern base map. You can compare years to each other. So you can see that this coffin factory and all these kind of, this laundry facility, all of these small businesses downtown get kind of swallowed up by banks and theaters and um, the Tremont Street Incorporation, whatever that is. So downtown changes a lot between 1885 and, 18, and 1938, um, which I'm sure doesn't surprise anybody. You can also kind of compare in different ways. You can do a swipe X, Y. Um, you can also play with the opacity of it, which I definitely recommend for especially um, residential areas. Let me see if I can show you something, something useful to you. So if we go down to somewhere where there's homes um, and play with the opacity, you can really see like how stuff changes over the years, how... Um, the neighborhood becomes populated. And you can see the, the difference in the names. So that's something that we often talk about is um, that the, the names can tell you a lot about the neighborhood. And you can also follow up on the name information and use um, like Ancestry or some other um, portal into census documentation to be able to find more information on the people who own the place and hopefully the people who live there as well. One caveat to using Alloscope for this kind of research is that, um, or using these maps, I guess, not really Alloscope, is that these are the names of the building owners and not necessarily the people who lived in the buildings. So it does give you a kind of skewed perspective on who, who live there because you're you're really seeing like the wealthier class, maybe the people who lived there the previous generation who now own the buildings and um, and rent them as opposed to the renters themselves. So um, the one other one other thing that I should show you is our um, collection site, which is. Um, collections.leventhalmap.org. You can always search something like Boston, for example, imagining you want maps of Boston. Um, you are going to get a lot of results if you search Boston, 7,969. Um, but you can filter by a lot of things. So you can filter by place. Um, so you can choose maps that have been tagged as Boston Place. You can um, filter by date, which I find really helpful. Um, I think that that's a really cool uh, way to look at the maps, especially maps of Boston, where you might be focused on a specific time period for your research. We have some really modern maps in the collection, including like this Boston Neighborhoods map, which tells you the top 10 countries of birth for foreign born population in Boston um, by neighborhood, which I think is a really cool map. And it's also really beautiful. This is, is this a, this is a BOSS BPDA map. And um, another thing that we have recently in our collection is that's related to that is the BRA map collection. So here's a really great, beautiful example of that. The Boston Redevelopment Authority was the precursor to today's Boston Plans and Development Association, or is that what it's called? Um, and the, um, the maps that we have from them, we uh, accessioned from our government docs collections. Um, 
and there are just so many detailed maps of plans of Boston, some of which panned out and some of which didn't, which is uh, another really interesting layer that not all of these maps, which is true of all maps in our collection, not all of these maps show you what actually existed. They show you kind of a version of what could have been or what was planned or um, what was uh, kind of interpreted uh, about the landscape and not necessarily a true to life um, depiction of a landscape. So um, that is, is there anything else I was supposed to hit, Dennis? No, that's good. You want to send it back to me and I'll quickly uh, do those last two resources and sure. Do you have your um, I have my screen, my whoops, share your screen. Here we go. Thank you. So there's a couple other places you can go if you don't find what you're looking for at the Leventhal. Uh, the next place is Digital Commonwealth. It's a, a consortium of libraries and other uh, sources. So that it has both maps and images. A lot of the images that I showed you in the uh, earlier Green Line presentation come from here. There's also the <clears throat> Massachusetts Real Estate Digitization Project, which has digitized many, many atlases uh, and you can get a list of them here. Uh, the Leventhal has put m some of these, especially the ones in Boston and immediate area uh, on Atlas scope, but there's a lot of atlases from other towns in Boston. So you can just scroll down here and find the town you live in if that's what you're interested in. And click over here on the Flickr one is a, it's a good one to use where you can, and it will bring up uh, good quality digitizations for you to look at. They haven't been georeferenced though, like the uh, Atlas Scope has. And then the last so, thing- so We do hope to do that eventually. So if you're uh, <laughs> if you're in the market for, uh, for donating to a map project, we are trying to, we're applying to grants and stuff, but we always welcome um, help in, in hiring people to be able to do that kind of georeferencing work because it takes a lot of person hours as Dennis and I both know um, <laughs> from firsthand experience. Um, and we would love to be able to expand Alice to more areas of Massachusetts. And one last place you can go, uh, the uh, Boston Atlas is part of the Boston Planning and Development Agency successor to the BRA that uh, Rachel mentioned. And they have a collection of digitized and geo-referenced um, atlases, sheet maps, and aerial photos. So you can you know, click on one of these and it'll show you a whole list of uh, the various atlases, the various um, maps that have been digitized and geo-referenced and bring them up so you get to. So that's a, you know, a, another place you can go if uh, you don't find what you're looking for on the other ones. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's the end of the presentation material that I, we have, I believe. So I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, I guess we we want to hear from you about what you're up to and, you know, how we could help. Yeah, if anybody has questions, if anyone's doing any sort of historical geography research, or if you have questions about anything that we said today, um, we would love to talk to you about it. Um, we also, we've gotten, we've gotten a bunch of comments over the, over the presentation. Alan Wu uh, was very prolific and told us about the spray company in Western Mass, which pioneered streetcar electrification technology and talked about um, how um, inconveniently subway <laughs> means an underground pedestrian passage um, to Brits um, and not, uh, not a train underground. Um, we've got some really useful comments from uh, Ron Newman about the, the North Station platform for the green and orange line, which is pretty recent, it turns out, which makes sense. Um, and said that before that, the green line trains either looped on Canal Street or climbed to an elevated station above Causeway Street. Um, Oh, Ron also said this cool thing about that there were two portals at different times on Boylston Street, one just inside the public garden and the other in the middle of Boylston. So we saw that one um, on the Atlas Cove map. And that's it.
that's pretty much it. And and somebody also, oh yeah, Ron also mentioned that <laughs> the um, Leachmere and Union Square will open in October, followed by Medford, the Medford, the other kind of line um, in December, which is very exciting to me because I live here now in Somerville. Um, and it was funny to hear you talk, Dennis, about like the differences between the green line and the orange line, because I've lived on both in my time in Boston. Uh, and the, the differences are palpable, um, in, <laughs> especially in speed <laughs> and volume. Um, we got a, a new question. Um, were the historical developments of the MBTA inspired by other world examples? So do you know anything about that? About um, Well, yes, through a streetcars, uh, the horse-drawn streetcars were common in New York well before Boston. Uh, the, uh, the Boston Transit Commission in the 1890s did look at what they were doing in New York, which was steam-powered elevated uh, and rejected that and you know went with the electric system. Uh, but Boston was a pioneer for a while. I mean, it was the, as they said, the, the West End Street Railway was the first unified transit system, a large city. Uh, Boston was among the first to electrify. Uh, the first uh, Sprague installation was in Richmond, Virginia, and Whitney went down there to see a demonstration before he selected that to use in the, for the West End Street Railway. Um, but uh, I, I guess... Uh, and that's those are the two leadership ones. I don't know if uh, Boston, to what extent they copied Chicago in, in doing an elevated system. That's a question to look up, I guess. Yeah, that would be an interesting thing to, to find out. Cool. Um, well, we definitely want to help people. If you, um, if you have a historical geography project that you're working on that you just don't want to talk about right now. Um, we are always open for um, to help you. We are happy to um, answer any emails that you have. I will give you uh, the info at leventhalmap.org email address. I pop that in the, the comments. So that should be useful to you. I also put in the comments a feedback form for today's presentation, which we would love if you could fill out. Um, because we want to know what we're doing well, what we could do better. Um, we are always happy to make this more or less interactive, depending on what people are interested in. Um, but we really love to to talk to people because we miss being in person mm -hmm. and having <laughs> real events where we uh, look at people in the actual face. So. Um, Oh, and Alan just dropped uh, a book that might be really useful to us. The Under the Race Underground, Boston, New York, and the Incredible Rivalry that Built America's First Subway. That's a fun book. Have oh, you read it? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I remember I went to the Mass Historical Society, I think it was, for an author talk when it came out. I think it, was, it came out around 2010. And then the author, of course, did a couple talks locally to promote it. That's great. That's awesome. That oh yeah, and and again, I just want to plug the Stephen Boucher um, uh, talk that we had a couple weeks ago, which is still on our our YouTube and uh, Facebook pages. If you're interested in watching, and somebody else pointed out that the uh, oh the Back Bay was filled by the D line, the Reservoir line, oh yeah, the mm -hmm. Riverside line, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So it wasn't a D line then. It was it was the Boston and Albany Riverside branch. <laughs> True. Got to keep our terminology straight. It's very confusing. Oh, and and, and the question about the, uh, the uh, about the historical development side. I guess one other thing I forgot to mention was Boston was the first city in America to have a streetcar tunnel to put you mm -hmm. know the electric transit on, underground. Yeah, and there's um, there's a really great exhibit about it in in the Boylston Street stop, right? Yes, if you go to the Boylston Street stop, you can, there's some historical panels and then behind the, the mesh cage wall, you, there are two old trolley cars, one, one a PCC like you saw in a Riverside uh, um, and 
uh, Watertown branch photos I showed, and another, the uh, wooden predecessor of that from the 1920s. Mm -hmm. that, that's fun. Yeah, I, I really like being down there. It, it makes waiting for the train much more interesting. And it also takes the history all the way back to pre-contact and talks about um, mm -hmm. the fish weirs that were there mm -hmm. um, that they dug up when they uh, created the tunnels. So evidence of landscaping and use of land and um, land was dynamic and and acted upon for a really long time before the uh, yeah, and Before that, colonists got here. And that Race Underground book yeah, tells lots of stories about the construction of the tunnel, how they uh, dug up unmarked graves that they had to relocate, of the big gas explosion at the corner of Tremont and Boylston that was a side effect of construction. I'm going to have to read this book. <laughs> cool. Well, if anybody, if nobody has any more questions, um, we're happy to field them asynchronously after the fact. Um, Again, fill out that feedback form. I will post it again. Um, and we are available to you pretty much any time during uh, business hours to talk to you about any any and all of your historical geography or modern geography needs. We all have mm -hmm. two reference librarians, um, one of whom deals with our um, our like physical map collection more, and one of whom is more focused on uh, digital mapping stuff. Um, and GIS. So either of those things are up our alley and we would love to help you with them. So thank you guys so much. See you in a month or so. We haven't planned our next event, but stay tuned and we'll let you know. <laughs> Bye guys. Bye.